Is that a way out of this mess that we are in right now? This is not a party uh, problem. It is a human problem. Federal government issued more than $236 billion in improper payments in fiscal year 2023. You cannot telework when you have to literally walk through the aisles and look through file cabinets. President Biden, when he was vice president, said, uh, and this is a quote, we are trying to create a multipolar world. This report that came out on March the 6th, you've not followed up on anything from it to, to, to see if there's something there that you need to do? We, we are following up to make sure that there are no abuses. When employees are, are, allow, are being allowed to work hybrid schedules. Well, thank you for acknowledging they work. Um. <laughs> exactly who would this uh, tax increase be good for? I believe the tax increase would be, um, would not really harm the competitiveness of business. Welcome to our first subcommittee hearing on the fiscal 25 president's budget request. Appearing before the subcommittee today are Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Office of Management and Budget Director Shalanda Young, and Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, Jared Bernstein. Among those, biennial budgeting with annual reconciliation and continued oversight. Is that a way out of this mess that we are in right now that continues to send a message to the American people that we can't even do our basic responsibility, and that's pass budgets on time, deliver appropriations on time, and give the agency certainty. Uh, to be quick, which is this is not a quick issue, uh, we clearly have an inherent process problem. Process, in my view, makes good results. Uh, this budget's 30 days late. The last budget's six months late. We need to figure out a way to get out of that do loop. Uh, and I'm all for finding solutions. What I do worry about I think there is inherent value to Congress looking at a part of the budget every year. Uh, we've heard, all heard a lot of complaints about not looking at programs that are, that are entitlement or mandatory. Well, we still get a shot. It is ugly. We got to find a way to make it easier. But I would hate to lose the one process where everybody is forced. I mean forced. And it's so ugly if you're not forced to do it, you wouldn't do it, in my view. And you're talking to the old staff director here. I, w I would hate uh, to see anything get in the way of that annual process. But I do think, Mr. Chairman, as you pointed out, there are ways to get that process uh, on time. Uh, sitting in this seat now, I will tell you, managing a federal government in three-month and two-month and two-week intervals is no way to do business, and none of you would choose to do it that way, and it is clearly inefficient. Um, we have a complex world, Department of Defense, and we can't tell them what's going to happen Saturday or Sunday. Um, there's something wrong with that. Both parties are to blame. This is not a party uh, problem. It is a human problem of uh, delay and dissemble, which is pretty harsh, but I think that's what it is. Now, let me ask you a question. $650 billion of investment. When was the last time we had $650 billion of additional investment, which I think was... Uh, uh, motivated by the infrastructure bill, uh, by the uh, uh, science and, and uh, chips bill, and the IRA. When was the last time we had $650 billion in one year of additional private, private sector investment? I honestly can't think of a time when we've had such a response. It's been absolutely dramatic, and I think it's been driven by the trifecta of legislation, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, um, the Chips and Science Act, and um, especially the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the most dramatic, important piece of um, environmental legislation in history, and we're seeing an unprecedented response. Secretary Yellen, do you believe that tax dollars of hardworking Americans should be given to CCP affiliated companies or their U.S. subsidiaries? In the interest of time, just yes or no would be helpful. Well, really, we, it is our job at Treasury to implement the law that has been passed by Congress, and we're doing our best to do that. The 45X um, production credit, advanced production credit, is intended to onshore 
important energy supply chains, and it can only go um, when there is significant production of the um, components um, indicated in the legislation has to occur in the United States. But the legislation does not preclude Chinese companies. Uh, I, anybody who wants to answer, I, I, maybe all of you very quickly, what would restoring that expanded child tax credit mean to families, in addition to lifting families out of poverty, what are the broader economic benefits of the child tax credit? Eric? Uh, I, uh, thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, as you well know, uh, and your fingerprints were very much on this development, uh, the expansion of the child tax credit that the president signed into law helped to drive child poverty to a record low of 5.2%. Never in this country have we had such low child poverty, and uh, scholars of poverty, uh, child poverty will tell us how important that is, not just for uh, year one, uh, but for the rest of that uh, child's life. Uh, when uh, the uh, CTC uh, expired, um, that child poverty rate uh, snapped back up. Um, and the conclusion is that the level of the child poverty rate is very much a policy choice. Uh, this president in this budget, and this committee uh, uh, has worked with us on this, you. Uh, 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 you in particular, um, proposes to restore uh, the expanded child tax credit, thereby uh, taking child poverty uh, back down uh, to uh, levels I'd mentioned uh, uh, earlier and uh, fully paid for uh, as well. Um, one of my top priorities in Congress is, of course, to advocate for the taxpayers in Iowa, the working families that uh, we are all here to serve and ensure that their tax dollars are being used responsibly uh, to support Iowans' uh, priorities. But unfortunately, we've seen a lot of improper payments continue to be a source um, of waste for federal taxpayer dollars. Actually, according to the report from Government Accountability Office, the federal government issued more than $236 billion in improper payments in fiscal year 2023. For context, that's more than the entire budget of the U.S. Army annually. And since 2021, the federal government has reported a staggering $764 billion in improper payments. Uh, so, Director Young, um, I know you're over there, but um, I just have a quick question for you. Um, has the administration taken a single step to ensure that these taxpayer dollars are being spent responsibly to prevent these improper payments before they occur? Um, $236 billion is a lot of money. Well, one, the ARP provided funds to the Department of Labor uh, to begin the process of trying to improve the unemployment insurance program, which uh, I think most people here will say that is one of the largest drivers of improper payments. This budget also has further proposals that would save $2 billion on UI. Uh, so we welcome and we are starting to see some movement in some of the oversight agencies on moving on uh, the budget proposal. It was in last year's budget as well uh, to do something about some of the higher, uh, the higher improper payment uh, programs of the federal government. Are you looking at using technology like AI to help attract these things before they actually happen? I think that would be ultimately the best outcome here is if we can stop them before they go out so we don't have to worry about trying to claw them back. Well, that's one. You heard me earlier talk about um, the, the need to make sure the federal government stays ahead on technology. One thing we struggle with, frankly, uh, and OMB is at the center at trying to figure out how to have proper AI talent across the federal government. And frankly, we don't have that right now. Uh, and we need to, to keep up with the technology to make sure we know how it impacts the American people, but also to utilize it uh, for things like this. UI is difficult because you've seen one UI program, you've seen one. Um, we have a federal overlay, but each state runs it how they want. Um, so we are interested to see how we can utilize AI. But frankly, we, we at OMB are trying to deal with the AI talent um, deficit. As a separate issue, though, from as a, as a separate issue, but, but it is important. If we want to utilize these tools, we have to have the people uh, that know how to do that. And part of our budget and part of what we're trying to do is ask for more talent there. But on UI, uh, we're not leaning heavily into uh, to AI, but we do have proposals to try to fix those programs. So my first question is, how long will the provisions in the FY25 budget extend the solvency of the Social Security program? Well, as you know, you've heard from the president what our principles on Social Security are. Uh, no benefit cuts. Uh, ensure that we have uh, a, a enough funding for those with disabilities um, who receive uh, payments out of, so out of Social Security as high-income earners. 
uh, to pay more into the system, uh, and you get uh, additional years insolvency. We also uh, point out something in direct control of this committee, uh, which is Social Security Administration, who has been underfunded, and as beneficiaries go up, uh, and there are more people to serve, we are seeing a decline in resources at a time when Social Security Administration needs more. That is why this president's asked for a 9% increase to fund the Social Security Administration. Meanwhile, the IRS at the same time announced earlier this year that it's setting a goal for employees to be in the office just 50% of the time in May. So we're being asked to employ more uh, federal workforce, and this is true across all the agencies. Anyone who does caseworks knows that anything from passports to VA benefits to farm help to helping people with Social Security benefits, that the timeline to, to get cases solved has massively expanded while the federal workforce continues to, to, to go, quote, to teleworking. Um, and so the productivity is going down, but we're being asked to solve that by by adding more people instead of finding ways to bring higher productivity. So I, I would encourage us to find ways to get people back to work. We're expecting the people who are funding the salaries of the IRS taxpayers to get people to work. And, and so uh, I, I would recommend that we, we do that. If you had a thought. Well, you know, we're making sure that IRS, as well as all bureaus and treasury departmental offices um, meet the standards that have been set for the federal government, which is at least 50% time for everyone in the office. And many employees have to be there absolutely every day. And this applies absolutely to IRS employees in many parts of the IRS. To, to, to the ve veterans that I'm working to try to get cases solved for them, 50% isn't enough to show up at work. Well, and, and literally speaking, one of the facilities was a literal work uh, warehouse where the VA records are stored and have not been digitized. We funded them, I think it was to the tune of $60 million to digitize those records. They didn't do it because of COVID protocols. We tried to put in non-teleworking. You cannot telework when you have to literally walk through the aisles and look through file cabinets. And we couldn't even get teleprovisions passed uh, by our friends on the left who opposed that provision. Uh, this administration and, and uh, President Biden, when he was vice president, said, uh, and this is a quote, we are trying to create a multipolar world. In other words, we're trying to create a world where the United States is not the preeminent force. Now, most taxpayers would say that we should share the goal, regardless of where we are on the aisle, of United States remaining a pre premier influence in the world. So I would ask you, as you're addressing spending policy and, and these kind of things, do you share that goal of, of, of bringing the United States down a notch and us not being uh, the premier influence I, in the I world? I do not share the goal of bringing the U.S. down a notch. I think it's essential that the U.S. Uh, shows strong leadership throughout the global um, economy and uh, leadership on the full range of challenges the world faces. I strongly believe the U.S. dollar needs to remain the world's primary reserve currency. And um, I see few challenges, real challenges to the U.S. dollar it may be that there are BRICS countries that would love not to be dependent on the dollar, but um, none of those countries seem willing to accept any of those currencies as um, an alternative for doing business. And there's a very good reason for that. The U.S. is a well-managed country from a macro perspective. Inflation has for decades been low and stable. We have the deepest and most liquid capital markets in the world, and um, a rule, rule of law and institutions that support the dollar's use as a reserve currency. Now, it is, it is helpful when we want to impose sanctions on other countries. The dollar's role enables us um, to do that because by um, using our sanctions tools to prevent malign actors from running transactions yeah, I, through the financial system. I understand that, but I think, so there's I think a desire. we would be, if, if we, we have a lot of strengths, but if we're not wary of the fact that, historically speaking, when a currency collapses, it happens overnight. 
we've got to shore up our, our fiscal. Need to move on. Mr. Pocan. Secretary Yellen, what steps is Treasury taking to set up robust enforcement of these labor standards to ensure projects pay prevailing wages and utilize registered apprentices? And will those steps include our suggestions around PLAs and front-end monitoring? Well, let me say that we're working with the Department of Labor closely to respond on this issue and to provide some clarity and certainty on the requirements. Um, I will say that when a taxpayer goes to claim that credit, that um, there will be rigorous procedures to make sure, given this is, in most cases, 80% of the total credit. So satisfying this is necessary to get most of the credit. There will be requirements when a firm is audited to provide books and records to show that every worker um, has um, received um, ap appropriate prevailing wages and the apprenticeship requirements have been, have been met. March the 6th, 2024, the House Judicial Committee released a report detailing the Financial Crime Enforcement Network, FinCEN, partnership with the FBI to gain access to uh, consumers' information from major banks posted January 6, 2021. As a way of tracking and targeting, in, targeting individuals, it assumes could be domestic terrorists based on certain financial transactions they made, such as dick sporting goods or, or mobile payments that use uh, keywords like MAGA. Are, are you familiar with this report? I am, I am familiar with the issue that you're just... What, you're what actions are you taking to ensure that this FinCEN is not targeting conservative Americans for their constitutional rights or political beliefs? Okay, so I'd like to put this in perspective if I could. Very quickly, if you would, because yes, I got a second question. Th this is activity that took place before I reached Treasury. Well, what are you doing today? The previous today? administration and it ended in February of 2021. Um, in the aftermath of the attack on the Capitol, um, there was an, uh, an attempt by law enforcement to identify perpetrators of the attack. FinCEN had been authorized by Congress to work with financial institutions in a process called FinCEN exchanges to help them identify they are required to file suspicious activities reports. Yes, I get that. And they I'm, wanted I'm, to get reports. I'm asking you what, what are you doing today this. to prevent that from happening again? This this is a practice that has ended and the, the so you're, you're doing work nothing that to follow done, up on it? The, there was no requirement for any bank to do anything. Banks met with some people but, from FinCEN but, to discuss how to But search. this report that came out on March the 6th, you've not followed up on anything from it to, to, to see if there's something there that you need to do? We, we are following up to make sure that there are no abuses. Okay. But it is our obligation to work with financial institutions to help them help the government identify um, suspicious and, and illegal um, transactions. Well, I can appreciate that, but, but innocent Americans, we don't need to be doing that on. Uh, and I, I, understand, I understand where you're going with that. Um, uh, Director Young, White House Chief of Staff requires agencies to submit action plans on OMB in January regarding their office spaces needed, but those haven't been made public and the 2025 budget process doesn't appear to, to realize any significant savings from buildings, uh, from, from building um, consolidation, either in D.C. or throughout the country. Why are we continuing spending over $10 billion annually on maintaining these buildings and securing leases for space that federal employees, when employees are, are, allowed, are being allowed to work hybrid schedules? Well, thank you for acknowledging they work. Um, <laughs> this is about return to the office. Uh, let me be very clear, just like the secretary pointed out, there are thousands of uh, federal employees who never 
got any opportunity to work hybrid in the thick of uh, the pandemic and put their own health at risk. But you're right, OMB is central to, uh, and we have put out guidance uh, because we see the value just like you all do. You see people face-to-face, -face, there is value in meaningful in-person work. But there has been telework pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. It's about mission. Different jobs have different requirements. I have some people at OMB who work in a SCIF. They've never gotten a chance to, to take advantage. So this is about mission. Uh, we think meaningful in-person uh, presence, even for people who have office jobs that don't necessarily have to come to the office, like for SCIFs. So we are working, and we are seeing uh, we are seeing improvements there. But, but I'm, I'm running out of time here. My question is: the ten billion dollars annually we're paying, we see no reductions with this staff, this group not coming back. With that said, uh, can will you commit that the OMB will lead this effort so we can consolidate under utilizing office space? Mr. Carl, you, the chairman, Mr. Hoyer, I think we all have an interest, and I've talked to the chairman a lot about this. And she's doing something about uh, space utilization, which frankly was a problem when I worked on the subcommittee uh, more than 10 years ago. And we need the tools to make sure GSA uh, can consolidate and manage uh, as, the, as the manager of the federal portfolio. There are lots of challenges here pre-pandemic uh, pre uh, that remain. Uh, and I'm committed to, to working with you and anyone else who's interested. How much additional revenue can be gained for every dollar that's invested in IRS? Um, well, prior to the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRS was literally starved for resources, and the auditing rates on um, complex partnerships, corporations, and high-income uh, tax filers uh, dropped to um, exceptionally low levels, and the funding provided by the IRA is intended and is beginning to really change that um, and help us address the tax gap. There are various estimates of the rate of return on this spending, but a simple one is that for every dollar spent, um, $7 in tax revenue um, is generated. So there's, and some estimates are higher than that. So I'm just curious exactly who would this uh, tax increase be good for? Well, I believe the tax increase would be, um, would not really harm the competitiveness of business. Most studies that have been done suggested, suggest that there is very little, if any, economic benefit from having cut the corporate tax rate that almost all of the gains went to the wealthiest um, taxpayers. And um, it's deprived us of the revenues we need to deal with our budget deficit. Um, it's probably lowered uh, TCJA, probably uh, lowered um, revenues as a share of GDP by something close to a percent. So it partly explains the deficit. The kind, of, the kind of program that I think is good for American growth is the sort of um, legislation that President Biden has championed and has been passed by Congress, much of it on a bipartisan basis, uh, making and, investments. And, 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 and thank you, because I'm going to run out of time here, and I've got a couple more questions I'd like, I'd like to move on res re respectfully. And so I think we have a philosophical difference on exactly who is the rich. Uh, I'm referring to a corporate tax rate increase that's in, in, in the budget. Uh, a, co a corporation is not a rich individual. A corporation is a band or a group of individuals and entities that have invested their money in, 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 in order to produce jobs, buy equipment, and that, and that sort of thing. And so if, if we're talking about Bill Gates, maybe we could say, here's a rich person and maybe he should pay more taxes. But when we're talking about a corporate tax entity, I very much believe that we are placing um, um, American workers at, at, at risk by not being as competitive 
uh, worldwide. And, and so can you reconcile the difference between a rich person and a corporation? Well, it depends what the corporate ownership is, but um, stock holdings are concentrated among relatively wealthy people and disproportionately among foreigners rather than Americans. Yeah, res res so res when we use the proceeds... And, and again, respectfully, because I, I'm going to run out of time. If we had more time, I'd love to hear the whole, the whole, the whole answer there. And, and so, again, respectfully, I would disagree with that statement because we're not, we're not all rich. A lot of people put a few hundred dollars in the stock market and own a few corporations. Uh, and, it, and it seems to me like a tax, an additional tax, uh, would be very counterproductive. Well, um, I think you have to remember that um, with the revenue that we get from those taxes, we're able to do things like s propose um, a, a larger child tax credit, which really goes to families and disadvantaged and do other things that are immensely helpful yeah. to working Americans. Again, it's a philosophical difference. We're not gonna, we're not gonna shake out here. I really appreciate how much um, federal workers uh, work, uh, how hard they work, especially the people that work for you. Um, and your effort in helping me address um, this longstanding issue with 911 dispatchers. I, I don't necessarily have a question for you. I just want to acknowledge how much um, work you have, you have done in helping to educate yourself and, and your staff on, on the plight of these primarily female workers that have not been recognized for the work that they do. So thank you so much for that. The discrepancy between federal and state cannabis laws have created conflict in the department's ability to administer that many areas under its jurisdiction. And as a former prosecutor, I shared his concern about the business, business having to deal with these huge amounts of cash and not being able to put it in depository institutions for public safety reasons. Can you tell me what is presently this, this administration's position on safe banking? Um, I think we would potentially welcome legislation in this area that would clarify for banks what their responsibilities are. At present, my understanding is that there is a conflict between federal law outlawing um, marijuana uh, sales and many state laws. And while I believe that there's not active prosecutions, um, banking organizations do feel compelled to um, be in, uh, um, in, in accord with uh, laws. And the fact that marijuana is outlawed by the federal government um, creates an impediment to their willingness to provide banking ser services to cannabis firms, and it creates all the problems that you're familiar with. And so um, I think legislation may be necessary to um, raise the comfort level that banks have with doing this business. Mr. Is Joyce, will you yield a second? I, I Just a second. Always. You're very kind. I, I, I agree with Mr. Joyce 100%. It is a shame that the Senate has not passed the legislation that we passed in the House. We're putting people in a very vulnerable position where they have large amounts of cash. We are encouraging criminals to break into uh, businesses that uh, deal in cannabis. I am neither a user nor a suggester of using, uh, but the fact of the matter is every state that's voted on it has uh, made it legal, every state. And uh, I appreciate your work and, and uh, whatever I can do to help you, I'm there. Thank you very much, sir. So is it fair to say that you share Secretary Mnuchin's uh, concerns and agree that the situation is untenable as it presently exists? I, I think it's a real problem and um, that it would be desirable to have legislation that alleviated this problem. Uh, Director Young, can you, how does the president's FY25 budget request address the fentanyl crisis and seek to change this reality? And is there some type of whole of government approach that this administration is working to pursue? Mr. Joyce, I got this question from a Democrat this morning and House budget from you here. It's one of the places that gets lost in 
rhetoric of, um, of the year on border. Um, when I was here, this is one of the places where there is agreement, and I hope we can find a way uh, to enact uh, the parts of the president's uh, supplemental, certainly that do deal with fentanyl. And this budget repeats those asks, $1.2 billion for DHS to stop fentanyl for entering the country. You know the NI equipment. Everyone says it works. We bought a bunch uh, years ago. We don't have money to outfit the land ports of entry uh, to put all of those in. We also need more equipment uh, to put in more land ports of entry. So we have a technology that works uh, that's not been fully implemented and utilized. Um, uh, and we'd love to work with anybody to, to help get that done. With all due respect, it, something that killed this many kids in our country, and not just kids, adults as well, we should declare war on. I yield back. With that, this hearing stands adjourned.